Good morning. Hope everyone is feeling well today. Our topic of conversation is how glad we are to be out this morning. Everyone I've talked to, that's what, that's what we've said. So it is good to be out. It is good to see everyone assembled to worship God today. We are thankful for your presence. We'd like to welcome those who may be visiting with us. We hope you will give us an opportunity to get to know you and stick around a little bit and we can shake your hand and hope you'll come back and visit with us, visit with us at any time. As usual, the attendance cards, we need to fill those out. If you would, uh, get one of those of the rack in front of you and fill that out so we may have a record of attendance. And the red side of the card would be for those who are visiting. So please fill that if out at this time. We also welcome those who are listening via the radio or the World Wide Web. We're thankful for you to be turned tuned in to us and listening to our worship service this morning. Hope you will come and be with us at any time you can. We have a nursery available for anyone who might need that down the hall to the right. Uh, actually it's left and then right. Um, we have Bible classes after our worship services, so if you're visiting with us, we are ask you to stay and attend one of those Bible classes. We have a lot of good Bible class teachers, and uh, we have a lot of good Bible classes, so hope you'll make arrangements to stay. This morning, as we began to worship, I'd like for us to think about why we're here and who we're worshiping. God is almighty, God is all-knowing, God is everything. And uh, this is why we come to worship him. Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 and 9, a very common passage, but I'd like for us to read it as we think about our worship today. God says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. Scott?
Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity you've given us to be here. We thank you for this church that meets here at Benton. We thank you for each member. We pray that you'll we'll be encouraged, you'll strengthen us, we'll be the proper Christian example you expect us to be. We thank you for all the elders that serve here. We pray that you'll be with them, all decisions they make regarding the church, and that the church here at Benton will continue to grow and be strengthened. We pray for the sick of this congregation, those who can't be here. We pray for those having tests. We pray for those about to undergo procedures. We pray that you'll be with them here, and if the ones who are traveling, you will be with them as they safely get there and get back. We pray that everything can be just in their life and they can have the health that they want. Heavenly Father, we pray for the Crocker family. We pray that you'll strengthen them and that you'll comfort them. Only you can. We pray for the others who have lost loved ones also, that you'll be with them and comfort them. God, we love you and we are so glad that you love us so much that you sent Jesus here, that he could live the life he lived, the perfect life he lived, and, and die the per perfect sacrifice for each one of us. Heavenly Father, we pray that you'll forgive us our sins. We know we fall short. We know we, we're constantly sinning. We pray that you'll forgive us our sins as we turn from them, and that you'll strengthen us so that we might learn from these and not sin these sins again, and, and we'll be strengthened. Heavenly Father, we pray that you'll be with us through the rest of this day and on through our lives. We ask this prayer in Christ's name. Amen.
1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse 23, read of the uh, institution of the Lord's Supper uh, as Jesus set it up. Um, it reads, For I received from the Lord that which also I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this and remember to me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And throughout the New and Old Testament, we're given reasons, necessities, albeit for our sakes, that Jesus uh, had to be, come to earth and, and be the sacrifice for us. We know that God loved us enough that he would send his son, but I want to look at a few scriptures this morning that will help us prepare our minds a little bit in understanding the reasons that Jesus had to come for our sakes. Galatians 3, beginning in verse 11. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide in all things written in the book of the law, and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. For the righteous shall live by faith, but the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by, shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming the curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. In addition to taking on that curse of sin for us, we read in Colossians chapter 2, beginning in thir verse 13, how he also canceled the record of debt that we have in sin. And you who were dead in your, your, in, <clears throat> you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Due to our sin, we're unable to come in contact with uh, God. Therefore, we read in Colossians 1, verse 21 through uh, 28, Jesus died on the cross to make us acceptable and blameless and holy to be in his presence. And you, who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to, to be together as Christians this morning, to commune together. We thank you for your son and for his sacrifice for us. We pray that as we take this bread representing his body, that we'll do so in a way of honor and remembrance of him. It's in his, his name we pray. Amen.
Dear Heavenly Father, we, as we continue our communion this morning, we, we thank you for, for Jesus' willingness to go to the cross. We're mindful as we partake of this fruit of the vine representing his blood, the, the, the punishment that he took and the magnitude of suffering that he bore on himself for our sakes. We pray that we'll take this cup in a manner of respect and honor and we thank you for, again, his sacrifice for us and the blessings from that. We pray this prayer in his name. Amen. Separate and part from the Lord's Supper, we now look at this opportunity um, to give back of our means to the church. Dearly Father, we are so thankful for the many blessings that you have given us. We realize that our spiritual blessings and physical blessings and the luxuries that, that we have here are um, some of the most anywhere in this world. And we pray this morning that we will be generous in our, our giving back a portion of our means and that the funds will be distributed in the best way possible and for the growth of the church. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.
The scripture reading for this morning is from John, the second chapter, verses 1 through 11. And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto them, They have no wine. Jesus said unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone, after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus said unto them, Fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out, draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, he knew not whence it was. But the servants which drew the water knew. The governor of the feast called to the bridegroom, and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine. And when the men had wa- have well drunk, then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee, Galilee, and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. You may be seated. Good morning. It is good to see everybody today. It felt really good to be able to look outside and not see as much snow, right? That was a good thing. And uh, it's good that we are able to be together. Last week amazed me. As bad as the weather was and as much snow as we had, it amazed me the number we had. So I'm glad that everybody was able to make it. I'm glad we were able to be together. Go ahead and turn in your Bibles to John chapter 2. We'll look at verses 1 through 11, the passage which Jared just read for us a few minutes earlier. And as you and I look through that passage, we see something pretty interesting going through there. It's the uh, first of the signs or miracles which John lists in his gospel. As we think about the purpose of the gospel, we see it written in John chapter 20, verses 30 through 31, where John says, These things are written that you may believe... And that by believing, you may have life. And so from chapter 2 through chapter 12 of the book of John, we see what's called seven signs or seven miracles, each one showing that Jesus is a Christ. But those signs, as we look at them closely, become pretty interesting pretty quick. Because as we go through, you see where Jesus heals the centurion's son. Jesus uh, makes a blind man able to see. Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. Jesus heals a man who is filled with a demon. We see the different works, and each one is showing that Jesus is the Christ. But what's interesting or maybe confusing to you and I today, oftentimes when we read the Bible, is the very first sign. Because if Jesus is spending all of his time healing everybody, what in the world's going on in this first sign where he's changing water to wine? We would think, well, you know, that's not really a miracle that's helping somebody physically. It's not raising somebody from the dead. So why would John list this as the very first sign to prove to you and I why Jesus is the Christ? Now, we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Once we pass verse 5 of this passage, hopefully in a few minutes, we'll, we'll understand why this is the very first of the signs of the very first of the miracles which is written. But as we get started introducing this passage, let's go to see where... Most of us, usually when we preach in this passage, end up. Let's go ahead and look at the idea of Christians and alcohol and what it means about when we think about alcohol. A lot of times when the use of uh, social drinking or whether or not Christians can drink comes up, this is a passage where people go. This is not exactly what this passage is about. So we're taking out of context when we go here. But sometimes people read this and they'll go through and they'll say, ha, Jesus made wine. If Jesus made wine, that means I can drink all I want, right? Well, that's not what the passage is talking about. Other people would pull this passage up and they'll look at it and say, wait a second, Jesus made wine. He must have made grape juice because Jesus would not have made an alcoholic beverage. And yet, when you look at the Greek of the passage, it does look like he made an alcoholic beverage. But let's look closely and see what the Bible teaches about alcohol and about whether you and I have any business as Christians drinking. 
Well, first and foremost, we see in Romans 13, it talks about how you and I need to follow the law of the land. So if you're under 21 or if you're around to drive or anything like that, you must absolutely stay away. As we continue reading in Scripture, we see that we are not to be a stumbling block. We see that we are not to uh, do something which might hurt our brother. And you see that in Romans 14 and also in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We also see that we're commanded never, ever to be drunk. Ephesians 5, 6 tells us not to be drunk. You go a little bit later in that passage in Ephesians uh, well, 5 as well. Do not be drunk with wine, but instead be filled with God's Spirit in your heart. And as we look at the book of Proverbs, you see in Proverbs 23, where it warns us about what wine and alcohol will do. It talks about how it causes the redness of the eye and the illness of the health. It talks about how it makes us do stupid things. In this passage, it talks about how a man is on a boat and he's sitting there beating himself up and saying, look, this doesn't hurt at all. And so it's one of those things where we see that alcohol causes us to lose inhibitions and causes us to do things we shouldn't do. But perhaps the primary passage to look at when we're thinking about social drinking is listed a little bit earlier, 1 Peter chapter 4. And as you and I read there in 1 Peter chapter 4, Peter is contrasting what people in the world do and what people who are Christians do. And he says, if you're going to be a Christian, you must avoid drunkenness. You must avoid drinking parties. You must avoid revelries. Each one of those defines, in some sense, social drinking. And so the strongest passage for a Christian to go to when we're talking about social drinking is 1 Peter chapter 4 because it tells you and I we are not to be around this sort of stuff. Now here in Marshall County, we have changed in the last year or so from a dry county to a wet county. And as you look at the statistics as far as crime, statistics as far as other things, you see the damage that is caused by the decision which many people made in voting in that election. But we also see the, 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 the damage which continually comes because people, sometimes even Christians, make the mistake of partaking of alcohol. Now, that does not have to do with the passage we're looking at, but I wanted to go ahead and bring that up in introduction because a lot of times that's what pops up in our mind when we get to John chapter 2. When we hit John chapter 2, that's what a lot of times will take our mind into this. And so now that we've covered that, let's take a step back and actually look at the text and see what the text says. As we read from verses 1 through 5, we see as we look here the shortness or the shortcomings which people have. And you see a man who's having a feast. Obviously, his daughter is getting married. He is very excited about her being married. And so according to the feast of the day, we see back in the days of Solomon and also in the days of David, that oftentimes these feasts would last seven days, sometimes longer than that. And what it was was an opportunity to show your wealth to everybody who was around. And so people would save up for the dowry, and people would save up so that they could kind of show off a little bit as everybody came in. And so in this honor culture, which existed during the days of Jesus, the worst, worst, worst thing that could ever happen is to run out of wine, is to run out of things to give away at the party. It's much like we are today sometimes. You ever remember, and I remember this growing up, oftentimes we'd have people over for, from church. Sometimes a visiting preacher would be, uh, you know, they'd have the sign-up list, and we'd have them over for the gospel meeting, you know, over for lunch or supper one night, or sometimes we'd host a devotional or whatever it may be. And so when that happened, guess what we did for a week before that guy showed up? It is time to clean your room, Mark, right? And so I'd clean my room like every high school or middle school kid would. I'd throw everything under the bed and everything in the closet and just pray it didn't come out. And I'd always tell my mom, Mom, we're living a lie. You know, we need to just let these people see how we are. And she's like, no, we can't let them see how we are. You know, you need to clean the house. And sometimes we find ourselves like that at church. Right now you're sitting there on that aisle, on that pew which is there. And you have your children and they're lined up and they're quiet and they're good. And everybody is looking at you thinking, you have a perfect family because we didn't see you in the car on the way up here. And we didn't see you as you were getting everything ready and as you were yelling at your kid to get out of bed. And those are sort of funny things, but a lot of times it's a lot more serious. Because we like to act like we have it together. 
We like to act like there's not a lot of problems in our life and that we understand everything and that we're just good. We live in an Instagram and a Facebook culture where everything is supposed to be right. And guess what? For this man right here in John 2, it wasn't right. And he was in trouble because his weakness, his shortcomings were very well known. Well, Mary didn't seem to marry the mother of Jesus, didn't seem to be in charge of this party. She didn't seem to be in charge of what was going on, but she was obviously very close to the people who were in charge. And so as this man is talking to the people, trying to figure out what he's going to do so he's not shamed, obviously Mary knows about it some way, and so she comes and she speaks to Jesus. Obviously, she had an idea who Jesus was. She was told by the angel before he was even born about his ministry and about what he would do. She saw as he was growing up his maturity, which was there, whether he was left in the temple during the time when he was 12 or other times as well. And so she knew that Jesus was somebody you could go to. And so we see a very interesting conversation where she comes up to him and says, these people are short of wine, and Jesus begins talking to her. Now, in our culture, and especially in our translation, sometimes it looks kind of rude. You probably didn't get away growing up calling your mother woman, right? Woman, my time has not yet come. Hey, clean your room. Try that, kids. Your mom tells you to clean your room. Woman, my time has not yet come. And see how long you last. You may be meeting Jesus quicker than you think. Well, Jesus here is not being rude, but he's making a point. And what that point is, is that nobody is in charge of him. He is not subservient to Mary or to any other person that was on the earth. But even though he doesn't have to, he does listen. And he lets it be known that he will help out. And so Mary turns to the servants who are there and notice that passage which he says. She says, whatever he says to do, you do it. Now, that is the theme of a Christian, right? Whatever he tells you to do, then you need to do it. Do what he says. Now, if you and I as Christians follow just that verse, we're going to be okay, aren't we? Because we need to follow Jesus when it talks about our life. Think about the plan of salvation. You have a lot of people who will say, well, you need to worship in this way and worship in that way. And you'll have different people who, because of different denominational traditions, will say, you need to operate in these different ways. What did Jesus say about salvation? In John chapter 3, verse 5, he says, you must be born of water and of spirit. In Mark 16, 16, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who does not believe shall be condemned. If you want to be saved... Follow the teachings of Jesus. When we think about worship, follow the teachings of Jesus. John 4, 24, those who worship must worship in spirit and in truth. In other words, you need to follow the canon, the law, which we find in Scripture. If it's in the Bible, do it. And if it's not in the Bible, be very careful and oftentimes avoid it. Be sure that you follow exactly what Jesus says at every turn. Going beyond just the actions, just the form of worship, we also see the attitude which needs to be there. We are to worship in spirit. Now, does that refer to the Holy Spirit? Jesus speaks about the Holy Spirit a little bit earlier in John 3. But here we see it's more towards the attitude that you and I have. We are to worship putting God first in our hearts. Yes, it's important for you to put money in a plate... But you have to recognize that's an act of worship. You are to be giving in a sacrificial way. Yes, you ought to close your eyes when we pray. But you need to be praying yourself to God. Yes, it's good to make it through the sermon. But you need to be looking to see how it applies to you. Listening to the Spirit of God as He speaks through the Word. To see what it is that we should do in order to follow after Him. As a matter of fact, in every aspect of life... We are to do what he says. Whatever you do, whether it be in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he will bless us in everything that we do. So you see here the aspect, the importance of doing what he says. And so as we look at these first five verses, you see the weakness or the shortness of man. How oftentimes we try to be what we ought to be, 
And oftentimes we try to live the way we ought to live, but we just can't. We fall short. Each and every one of us has sin in our lives, and each one of us struggle with sin and the things which are going on. Each one of us is in a battle for our souls, and each one of us realize very quickly we cannot win the battle by our own good works and by our own good deeds. And so we see the need which this man had as you and I read this passage today. But let's go to our next slide, and we'll see there in verses 6 through 11, Jesus changes the ordinary to the extraordinary. Now, I have not been in chemistry, sad to say, for 25 years. That's sad because it means I'm old, but it's good because it means I don't have to deal with chemistry any longer. All I know about chemistry is you throw salt on the ground and snow theoretically disappears. That's all I've learned over this last week. But as you look at these molecules, you'll see a difference between a water molecule and the ether alcohol molecule, which is there on your right. Is that correct? And so you, what I want to bring out by this picture is that when Jesus changes water to wine, it's not like he gets a Kool-Aid packet and just puts it in there and stirs it up. He's not just making a different kind of water or flavoring a water in a certain way. What you and I notice when we look at here, and part of the point which is being brought out by John, is that Jesus goes to the molecular structure, to the very inside and most minute part, and he changes water to wine. There's an addition of molecules going here. There's an addition of the structure of the molecules which are here. And you can't go from one to the other without a lot of work <coughs> of distillation and of time in the natural world. But Jesus, just by his statement, Jesus, just by his work, changes the ordinary to the extraordinary. Now, why does that matter to us? We went back at the very beginning of our lesson and we talked about the signs which you and I read in the Gospel of John. And many of these signs make sense. You want to prove that Jesus is the Son of God? Watch him bring Lazarus right out of that tomb. You want to pr prove that Jesus is the Son of God? Look at John chapter 9. Here's a man who's been blind all of his life and Jesus makes him where he can see. He makes the lame man where he's able to walk and run. He's able to take the satyrian son from a distance and heal him. Why does this miracle, changing water to wine, why does it fit in as a very first sign? Because Jesus changes something from its very substance, from its very smallest substructure to create something special. When you and I become Christians, it's not just because a simple addition of something that's sprinkled over us. It's not just because we got wet in the baptistry. It's not just because we are good people trying to live in a good way. What we see in this passage is that when you and I come to Jesus, when you and I admit our need, when you and I do what he says... He takes us from the very molecular structure, from the very smallest part of us, the very inward part that nobody else sees, hopefully, and he changes who we are. He sees me and my weakness and my struggles and my idiosyncrasies. And when I come to Christ, he changes me from ordinary to extraordinary. We want, Ephesians 2 verse 1... We're dead in our sins, but now we are made to be alive in Jesus Christ. We once lived to ourselves and lived to our own ways, but now we are living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God. We no longer, yes, we no longer conform to this world, but instead now we are transformed by the renewing of our mind. We once walked in darkness. But now as we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed us from all the sins that we have. And so what we see here is the changing of the ordinary to the extraordinary. And as you and I read in our Bibles, we see where this is the case. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Uh, let's begin in verse 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning in verse 17 we read in this passage about the idea of how we are saved. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. 
The old man is dead now. The old man has passed away. Now all things are become new. Now all things are of God who has reconciled himself to us. Now that we are ambassadors, pleading as though God were pleading through us, be reconciled unto God. Look there in verse 21 of 2 Corinthians 5. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we should be the righteousness of God in him. Now, looking back in verse 17, you see that second phrase and arrows which are there. You once were dead. You once were ordinary. You once were just like the rest of this world. You thought like people in this world. You acted like people in this world. You were, down to your very structure, worldly. But when you come to God, you're changed from ordinary to extraordinary. And you now think like God. You now are enslaved or bound or married to God. You now no longer live for yourself. You now live for Jesus. And allow him to work through you. And allow him to be yours in every instance. And in every way. Now, notice the effect or the power this has. As you and I read in this passage, we see where Jesus has a command to these servants. And he says, take these water pots. They're often used for ceremonial washing. I think there's six of them, if I'm not mistaken. Most people think they're between 20 and 30 gallons. It's a lot of wine being made. He says, fill these water pots up. And so they fill them up with water. Now, notice, this is not the pure drinking water which they had at the time. If you'll recall, back in this day, one of the reasons why wine was oftentimes drank was because water was not the safest thing in the world. If you took it directly from a well, if you took it from a living live water space, oftentimes it was safe, but not always. And so they had what we call potable water and non-potable water, right? Well, the water used for washing oftentimes was not the same water you would use to drink. It's not that it's unclean ceremonially, But you would be very careful. You'd have to really be thirsty before you take water out of these places. Jesus says, fill these with water. Now he says, once they're filled, I want you to go give this to the master of the feast. Imagine what's going on in the mind of these servants as they're working along and bringing this water to this the master. They're thinking, okay, I'm supposed to be bringing wine, and now I have dirty water. Not dirty water, but water which may be dangerous. Imagine the trouble I'm going to get in, because it looked the same in many ways from what we can tell. You bring that water to that master, and the master drinks it, and he looks at you, and you think you're going to be in trouble. But the master says, this is the best wine we've had. Why would you wait till now to bring this best that's here? You see the measure of faith which this brought. You and I sometimes look at our life and we see the shortcomings we have and the problems we have in life. Maybe you look at yourself and you see something you're struggling with and you think, God can't love me. If other people knew about this, I can't be what God wants to be. And so we live in guilt. We live in dread. And we live in just not feeling like we are lovable by God. But God takes that which is unclean and he makes it to be extraordinary. He makes that water which most people would not even bother to drink. They just use it to wash their hands and nothing else. And he makes it into the best thing they had at the feast that day. You know he does the same to us today. You and I living our life, we see in 1 Corinthians 3, God didn't call all the people who are rich necessarily. God didn't always call the people who are popular. God didn't call the people who always had it together. Oftentimes, God calls the people who had the greatest problems in life and the greatest shortcomings because he wants to make the ordinary extraordinary. And so God will take me. God will take you. Does that mean when we become a Christian all of our problems are gone? No, it doesn't. But it does mean God will work on you. God will help you to mature and to grow. God will place His Son in your stead to take your guilt away, to take your sins away, to make sure that you're a saint. Do you see the faith which it takes to be able to step into that place and to move there? 
but we also see the power of God to help a person through embarrassment. Imagine the embarrassment this man had as he realized what was going on. He realized his daughter was going to be shamed. He realized that the neighbors were going to talk about him. He realized he was going to be exposed. Jesus stepped into that place and he took the blame. He took the embarrassment and he took the hurt away. And that's the gospel that's come to us. Jesus has offered to come into your life to take away the hurt. To be there, to take the blame. To be there and pay for our sins, my sins and yours. So that we can have the gift of heaven. You see, in John 2, we see the power of God. The ordinary to the extraordinary. The one who stands in our place. We see the first and foremost sign showing us that Jesus is truly the Son of God. This morning, if you need to become a Christian, to be changed from ordinary to extraordinary, this is your opportunity. This morning, if you need the prayers of the saints, this is an opportunity for you. If the invitation applies to you, we invite you to come forward as we stand and as we sing. would bow with me at this time and let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Father, we are so thankful for the day that you have given us. We're so thankful for the time that we have to come and to worship you. We're thankful for the good lesson that we have heard this morning. We pray, Father, that we may all dedicate our lives to serving you, that we may study more from your word, that we may understand and that we may fulfill your truth in our lives. We're thankful, Father, for Jesus Christ. We're thankful for the great sacrifice that he gave. And, Father, we give you all the honor and glory and praise for everything. At this time, Father, we come asking for those who are in need of prayers in this congregation. We have those who are bereaved, Father, and we pray, Father, that you would guide them and that they, you may comfort them and help them to, to understand that you're the place that they will find comfort. And pr Father, we pray for those who are 
sick, those who are in need of your prayers. We pray, Father, that they may find their health once again and they, they may truly enjoy a healthy life. Father, we are thankful for this church. We're thankful for what each and every member means to this church and to this community. And as, Father, as we attempt to reach out and bring others to your fold. We pray, that, Father, that you will bless this church. Bless us on down through time. And, Father, forgive us, for we know we fail you. And these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we have some announcements today. Uh, first, we would uh, certainly like to uh, express our joy in the baptism of Joel Morgan. Uh, Jared baptized Joel uh, this past week, and we are thankful for that. And I don't see Jared here today, but or Joel, but uh, here, there's Jared. So we are certainly glad to hear that, Jared. I know that's a wonderful time in the life of your family. So we are grateful to hear that. We need to continue to remember the Crocker family in our prayers and the passing of Karen. And uh, some who are sick, uh, Betty Henson has been home with the flu and we need to remember her. Amy Guess, not feeling well and is in need, need of our prayers. And it would be good to send Amy some cards of encouragement. We need to continue to remember, remember Dylan Nanny. And also uh, have this good note, Mary Lou Levan is feeling better. And... Uh, she would uh, welcome anyone who would like to come and visit her now. So we're happy to hear that. Uh, Shella Mae Collins is, uh, hasn't been able to come to worship with us for some time and is currently staying with her granddaughter in, in Grand Rivers. She would appreciate hearing from us. Your call cards uh, would be appreciated, and they may be cards may be sent to her home address if you'd like to send Shalomay a card. Betty Matheny, the mother of Beth Lentz, has had the flu, and her condition is critical, and she has other health issues along with that. So we need to remember Betty and her family in our prayers during this week. We also uh, are saddened to announce the passing of Barbara Fields, who is the sister-in-law of Mary Lou LeVan. The visitation will be Wednesday from 11 to 1, and funeral at 1, is that correct? Funeral at 1, I believe that's correct. We, um, on the happy side, we want to uh, give our congratulations to Doris Harper. She reached a milestone of her 90th birthday today, I believe. So uh, we are, we're glad of that, Doris. See Doris back here with us. We're, we're happy to know that. There will be a deacons meeting this afternoon at 4 o'clock to discuss the 2018 work of the church. So this is really an important meeting, guys, and hope that every one of the deacons and elders will be able to attend. Uh, it is the time that we try to set our direction for the coming year. So please make uh, every attempt to come and be with us uh, at a meeting at 4 o'clock this afternoon. The annual corporate meeting will be next Sunday after our worship service. Uh, the table in the foyer has a lot of dishes. We make this announcement about once every three or four months. So find your dishes. And then this afternoon at 3 o'clock, the bus will be leaving to go to Glendale Road for the for a youth rally at Glendale Road. 3 o'clock. So you young folks be prepared for that. Um, Challenge Youth Conference at Pigeon Forge. We need to continue to remember that. There are a couple of uh, hope, ho housekeeping announcements, I guess. Construction in the building back where we're going to uh, rearrange some classrooms in the office area and on the other side of the hallway 
this, this construction will begin tomorrow. And so if you're in the building, be careful of where you're walking and, and watch what's going on. And I, I think the classes are all worked out where we we'll, uh, won't be bothered Wednesday night with that. So uh, just uh, being mindful that this is uh, going on in our building. We, uh, Scott tells me we don't anticipate any problems with it. And the decorating committee, the ladies who are working on uh, uh, paint colors and things for that uh, area and other things, I suppose, uh, will meet in the library today for a few minutes after class. Library today, a few minutes after class. If you could please come to that, those of you who are working on the decorating. Have a couple of cards I'd like to read at this time. This one's from the family of Avonel Schroeder. Says, we deeply appreciate your expression of sympathy in the passing of our mother. Thank you for the calls, visits, foods, and prayers. Mom loved all of you and spoke of you often. We so appreciate friends like you. And that's the family of Avonel Schroeder. And then also we have a card from Neil Haley. Says, thank you so much for the bag of Christmas goodies you sent me for Christmas. I have enjoyed every bit of it. Also, we are all really enjoyed seeing the young kids and love their singing for us from Neil Haley. All right, we have Bible classes to follow, a lot of good classes. Hope you'll make arrangements to attend. Worship service Wednesday night at six o'clock and or tonight at six o'clock and Wednesday night at 6.30. Have I missed anything? All right. If not, you got something, Mark? All right. Three more? No. Okay. Real quick, I want us to sing happy birthday to Doris. She got to 90 years old. That's a huge accomplishment, especially when her daughter's only 29 today, which would make Stacy 15. But let's sing happy birthday to her. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Doris. Happy birthday to you. And now to cleanse our palate, we'll have Scott. Are we done? We're done. We're done. We're dismissed on that.